Hello and welcome to the Woman Up podcast. Woman Up speaks to and about artists, academics, writers and activists, midwives, carers and more. All mothers or parents and all women and non-binary people. Those challenging ideas and ideals, questioning assumptions and provoking social change. The platform is dedicated to the people and women that are taking risks. To the ones trying to change current structures founded on biases that have to do with gender, caring, responsibilities, race and the integration of the private and the public. We will have conversations about lived experiences, achievements and aspirations. We'll also share campaigns and awareness around crucial intersectional struggles and subjects. Hello and welcome to Woman Up. Today we're speaking with Pauline D'Souza who is the founder and director of Diversity Art Forum that has funded the Hayward Gallery, Whitechapel Gallery, Art Night, Art Connection, B-Side, Airbike Gallery, Contemporary Hum, Traffico, SUD 2017, ICA and Weising Art Centre. She has written for feminist visual culture, women artists and modernism, Leap Into Action, for third text, Studio International, alongside other publications. She teaches part-time at the University of East London, is involved in the Beacon Collective and sits on the Tate British Artist Network Steering Group. Hello and welcome, Pauline. Hello. Hello. Nice to talk to you, Susan. Thank you for yeah, inviting me. Oh, you're very welcome. It's great to have you on. Um, I feel really excited, actually, to speak to you and um, hear about the work that you've done because it's uh, it's fantastic and and crosses a lot of areas as well. Um, and and. So talking about that, your past and your present has involved you, um, been involved with networks, setting networks up and um, more recently founding the Diversity Art Forum. Um, I'd love to know what your interests in the networks have been, you know, where that's come from. Uh, for example, you were involved, am I right, in the Black British Art Network, as well as the Feminism and Contemporary Art Network. Um, so all of these where... Where did that inspiration come from? Is that through necessity or um, or interest? <laughs> Actually, it, that interest goes way, way back before even those networks um, were formed. So the interest in network actually came when I was chair of the Social Human Rights Historians Executive Committee. So I ran the student group for the Social Human Rights Historians and I had to put together a team to actually help me do the various... Um, events and commitments that we had to do so it was important for me to put together a new group and then to make sure that group net connected with the other um board members of the executive committee so it's quite important to me that's when the idea about networking and communication came in so that's that's where the foundation comes in um in relation to the two networks that you mentioned obviously my interest in black art materialized in the 1990s when i was doing my second um, degree my ma and I wanted to look at contemporary artwork for my MA, but at the same time, I still do have a strong interest in Tudor history as well. So outside my official stuff, I, I go back to Tudor history and back to Tudor art as well. So it was important to understand the um, the black art movement as it was known then um, when I started studying for my dissertation in the 1990s to understand all that kind of network system because I was actually in Birmingham doing my MA so it was interested to see those connections with Birmingham and also originally I'm from London so it was interesting to see those connections from London and at the time I was living in Stoke-on-Trent um, which is as most people might know is a, an area which is high poverty um, um, has a high Muslim and Hindu population as well so it made sense to actually do that MA in that particular area and to start understanding those networks between the regions and between the centre, i.e. being London. So um, that materialised further when I started looking at um, harm renaissance and looking at female involvement in harm renaissance and then looking at the female involvement in black, the black art movement and being aware of Sonia Boyce, being aware of Lubaina Himid, being very aware of Maud Sorter. Um, I think it was, it was, yeah, it was Maud Sorter of her photography that really drew me into looking at the female presence in the black art movement. And that then increased my interest more into feminism because when I was doing my A-levels in, in the eighties as a teenager, I had a really good social um, social teacher. Um, she, I remember her name, her name was Kate. So, and 
we became friends actually it's quite weird we did become became friends while she was teaching me and um she was very passionate about feminism so she's the one who really introduced me to feminism so I really had that foundation so I just brought that with me when I went to go and do my degree MA in Birmingham so it was I wanted to understand feminism from a different perspective because all I got was a very much western notion about feminism but not really understanding black feminism so it was really made sense for me to connect with those two networks in the tape band to understand the discussions, the ideas, and, and hearing people's opinions about that. But obviously, me being me, I had my own opinions as well, <laughs> and wanted to share those opinions with people. And I also like networks because it gives you space to test ideas. It gives you space to um, see how people are going to respond to your ideas. It also gives you space to see how people are going to um, question your ideas as well, and make you rethink and make you reflect and make you understand that maybe you need to articulate your ideas a bit clearer because of people not understanding what you're doing and not it's okay to question, but if you're still questioning and still not understanding, then you need to rethink what it is you're trying to say and why you're trying to say it and what you're trying to do. So having a network system is really, really crucial for me. I, I need to talk to people. I, I can't work on my own. I, I'm up to a point I like working on my own, but I do need to communicate with people. I do need to hear people. I do need to test things and I do need to get people's response to things that I do as well. That's absolutely crucial to me. So any network that has some kind of connection to what I'm doing, I will join. I completely empathise with that. I'm very similar, Pauline. Um, I love the idea as well that you had, it was almost like the networks became a safe space for you as well to test ideas and to talk through things and get clarity in your ideas as well did that has that influenced your writing over the years the networks that you've been a part of oh absolutely completely um again going back to my MA um being trained as a academic art historian and having to write in an academic way um it's fine um and I appreciate what I have, have no skills but it did actually limit my level of communication in my writing completely and it's only a period of time where I feel that my writing has become more freer in how I want to communicate. Um, I don't have to worry too much about academic jargon in, in certain formats that I'm writing for, but I still do write for academic publications. So when I'm writing for academic publications, I put on my academic hat and write in that format. But it's really good to have different writing skills. Um, I also spent time talking to the creative writing team at the Royal College of Arts as well and spent time going to some of their conferences and hearing people talking about writing and I've been talking to Emily Labarge as well who also writes for different art magazines and, and is a creative writer who's busy writing on her own novels and short stories but also is very much interested in academic and contemporary art as well so she's someone I've always talked to and she invites me to things so she's kind of helped me be open about my writing and there's also a friend who I talked to Kiss Fies Wozniak who's written for Art Monthly who writes for Art Review and I get together with him and we talk about writing and they've helped me to think more about how I approach my writing and I think having those conversations with those two people and other people who write for magazines and spending more time looking at what's going on in contemporary writing has actually helped me to move forward from academic writing to be more free and more and to be able to communicate more in the way that I want to communicate. How how do you find um, this is really personal um, question from me because I don't find the time. How do you find the time to keep up with your reading and all of the networks that you're involved in? Do you is it does it come naturally? Is it easy? Is it a lot of juggling? Um, it comes naturally, basically. <laughs> I think it comes naturally because I'm a naturally curious person, okay. and and I want to know, and I want to engage. Um, and yeah, sometimes it does require juggling, but the juggling also comes naturally. Um, I do I do sleep. I must add, I do sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but sometimes I find myself getting up at two o'clock in the morning to do work because I need to do something. And then um, I feel I need to get up and, and do it. And then I, I'm, I feel happier knowing that I have done it. Otherwise, it will play on my mind, um, especially if I have deadlines as well. Um, some of the communications that I have with the networks I, I engage with are not all in the UK, so they're online communications as well, so it's different time frames, but also um, recordings happen and we can listen to each, other, each other's recordings and when we communicate again we just respond to the other recordings. I have a good um, friend now in America 
who's from South Africa, is now doing his MFA as a mature artist in, in um, America. So we've switched our time zones from South Africa to America to UK time zones. And he's someone I um, really engage with and communicate. And he's part of my network. He's my personal network. I, so I have group networks, but I also have personal networks, with people I can, who I trust and who I can share things with as well. So it comes naturally with a bit of juggling and yeah. and sleep and sleep. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it's um almost part. It's part and parcel of um some self care then actually as well within your within your work and practice. Uh, can you clarify what you mean by self care? Because... Um, so a way of looking after yourself, I guess. If you've got a person, you know, people that you trust that you know you can speak to. So it, rather than um rather than it may be feeling like a lot of work to keep up with these actually you know that they are helping you professionally and personally by having these connections yes um not all I would stress some um, some of them are just um professional but there are a few that are personal so yeah um if I feel I can talk to someone on a one-to-one level whether they are as, as my personal network and I feel that I can be honest with them I can be vulnerable with them I don't have to be professional all the time with them then it is a form of self-care and I think that's really important I think we have to establish those kind of um, spaces whether it's virtual or real to enable us to really do or think and engage in a way that we want to engage with so I think it's really people important for people to have areas of self-care and not just professional care yeah I, this isn't the order that I plan to ask you things at all. But, it's um, fine, it's fine, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but that's um, brought me around to the um, SayPals group that you, um, now did you set it up or curate it or um, what was your involvement in that? Um, so because I watched the recorded, um, I rec- watched some of the recorded um, workshop of that event, um, which was earlier in the year. Um, and you had speakers like Lauren Craig involved um, and you were looking at an integrated approach to care and um, yeah so where did your involvement in that come from? Okay that's that's quite easy but I also have to I'm, I'm, I'm yeah um, so it was my first engagement as a, a lady officer for this, the Emerging Creators Group for Tate Bam. And that was my first event that I attended, or, um, organized by the old curating group. And so I was there basically to just see what this group was doing, because um, officially in March the following year, I was going to be part of this emerging creator group as as a, um, an advisor and as, and as a liaison to the to people who were going to join the new creating group. And so, but at the same time, it was quite interesting to see that they were talking about care creating and community um and I was wanting to know what they were going to say because obviously thinking about creation and being aware of how people are creating it was something different and I just thought oh right okay let's see how we deal with care and community I mean care has always been there um and it has always been present in creation but I think because what on the political side of things it's been more dominant and, and has been more forefront but and I think maybe through the process of creating and working with technicians working with artists working with creators assistant creators working with institutions um there's such an emphasis to get things done to get the funding to to promote the show to promote the artists but this how you do that and how you make sure that people are happy and comfortable with that has been below has been pushed back to, the, to, the, to to engage more of the professional side of things. So care, I felt, wasn't really seen as being professional, but it, it was there, basically. So it was the first time to see something that care had become part of that professional dialogue. Yeah. So I was looking forward to actually engaging in that event. And up to a point, they were tackling what they were trying to do about that. But it was frustrating when they were talking about Black female writers and creators and they hadn't thought about actually inviting those people to be part of the panel Ah. that that was problematic and um a lot of people got upset about that um which is totally understandable and um I was being neutral because I didn't want to get involved in the argument I just wanted to engage and then I knew that we would be talking about it at some point and I would give my opinion afterwards um but obviously the situation got kind of out of hand and people got really upset so um, 
people who got upset. I was one of them, but I not but but in a different way. But um, so the Tate Band Steering Group decided that would be really important for us to get together and just talk about how we felt what happened with that particular um, session with the old group. Um, they felt that we needed um, some kind of healing, which is quite interesting because when we got together with Georgina, who was hired by the Tate to talk to us about how we felt traumatized, it's not what we wanted. We didn't want someone to heal us. We actually wanted to voice our opinion. So um, we were quite surprised that Georgina had asked us to prepare for this um, session with her and we thought no that's not what we want to do <laughs> so when she when she when we got together we did actually tell her what we wanted to do and that was fine but it was it was also a very difficult time for me as well because my father had just died or was dying and had just died from cancer oh, I'm so sorry Polly it's okay this is why I didn't take a moment sorry um Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. It's really hard. I understand. I just have some water and I'll come back to you in one second. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So anyway, I'm back now. So I agreed, I agreed to get involved because I wanted to also share my concerns about what happens at that session as well. But I was not, I was not um, mentally enough because of my situation with my father to really get involved in doing anything to do a presentation at the event that we put together on the 11th of December so I did say that what I'd be happy to to chair and the group knew that I was not in a good space to do any kind of presentation so they took they understood that all I wanted to do was just actually chair the session and ask questions and help the, yeah. in the in the production and um format of it so that was good to have that involvement and um, I feel I, I enjoyed, I'm glad that we did it, but at the same time, I, I feel we, I, it was a long time, not a long time, it was it was over, oh, it was nearly the whole day, and that was long enough. Um, I would have maybe preferred if we did two sessions and we had more time to do two sessions over a, a longer period, because I did feel that there were voices that weren't in our session that should have been in our session as well. Um, I really would like to hear a bit more about... Um, yeah, I would. I would have had. Yeah, I would have liked to have someone coming from talking about their experience from maybe from one of the Middle Eastern countries, for instance. You know, because I, I just felt up to a point we were still kind of putting ourselves into a box, um, a kind of black box, and talking to ourselves. And we had Jack as well, so it was really important to have Jack's voice there. Um, I, I was talking to when we were talking about it. I mentioned Jack. And I said I knew him, and I because I, he had connections to some people who I knew, so it would be really good to have him. You're talking involved. about Jackie Tan here, yeah? yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was really important to have have his voice um, in the in the mix as well. But I would have liked us to be a bit more open. Um, we were going to talk about doing an open call, and that didn't happen. I wish we had time to do that to get other people's voices in, so we weren't just talking to ourselves. But at the same time, we were talking externally, so we we're talking to ourselves and we we're talking to other people as well. Um, but I, at the end of the day, though, I think Siebel's did what it needed to do, yeah. and and I think I I know that people are still watching the videos of all oh, the video because people keep coming back to me saying we watched the video, and blah blah blah. I think, Great, yeah. fine. So. I'm glad it had some kind of impact but so that's that's my involvement in it and that's how, yeah. how it materialized <laughs> wow so that definitely um was far more complex than I'd uh, imagined from when I started watching it so I didn't see any I don't know whether I would from watching the video whether we would have um, been aware of um I, did it have questions and things at the end and that's when people were raising their concerns or because I think Lauren and I agreed because we talked about how we were going to introduce sequels and Lauren and I agreed that we would actually refer to what happened with um, the care creating and community event but we didn't go into detail we thought it was not worthwhile going into detail we just walked, we, yeah. we gave we gave a very general context at the beginning so um yeah. I spoke okay. first yeah so it's there I see so that what we saw recorded was the second session it was the um the session where you were responding really yeah exactly yeah okay yeah. that makes so much sense because uh lauren's piece at the beginning is very beautifully worded and um it's a it's a really 
good template for thinking about care within projects and organizations and I've spoken to Lauren about her um, ideas on that as well and it's very very uh, relatable um, and easy and clear to understand um, and but really powerful. Um, I wanted to ask so I came to see your sweetness and sorrow exhibition uh, that you co-curated um, can you tell us briefly about it? I don't know if it's still going on, but if it is, I'd like people to be able to hear about it. And um, what has the response been? Okay, um, that's the first time I've actually created this show in the UK under Diversity Art Forum that some that people have actually seen. Okay. And usually when I get involved in things with Diversity Art Forum, um, hands on, I'm usually out out the country, <laughs> so people don't get a chance to see anything. They might they get a link or an information about it on the Best Art Forum website, but they don't actually physically be in a space where things have happened. So it was good to actually get the opportunity to do something in the UK and to do something in East London as well. So um, Emma Roberts, who's the co-creator of that show, with um, did the Jamaica Making exhibition with Teresa Roberts' collection in Liverpool. And I went to go and see the exhibition. She asked me to come up and see the exhibition um, and to give my opinion about the creation. And also she told me that Teresa Roberts wanted the exhibition to travel and, and not to go necessarily to a big public gallery. She wanted to go to a different organisation and maybe an educational organisation with a gallery because she wanted students to somehow have some involvement with her collection. And earlier we were talking about networks. So... Emma Roberts and I um, are really good friends. And when I was the chair of the Association of Art Historians Executive Committee, Emma, I, I invited Emma and asked Emma and spoke to Emma and interviewed Emma to be my secretary. <laughs> so that's a build up on networks. <laughs> so, okay. so networks follow through with me all the time in some way or another. So um, when Emma and I got together in Liverpool to look at the exhibition, we, we walked around and talked about it. And I did tell her, and the exhibition in Liverpool was, had all of Peter Roberts' collection. And I knew that the gallery in East London could not fit all that work, including the sculpture. So I spent time with Emma talking about the works that interested me in the collection, which I thought weren't really given enough space at the gallery in Liverpool. And I thought it was really important to actually allow the contemporary artwork in the collection to have space and to have a different dialogue and to be seen in different kind of context. So um, spent ages, also during the summer holidays, talking to Emma and Teresa, um, looking at this vision, also looking at the works online, how they were created online in Teresa Roberts' website, and just thinking a bit more about what words will go together. So I met up, Emma came down to London a few times also to see the space, and Teresa came to see the space. And in between these meetings on and, physically and online, I was telling them how I was formulating the exhibition and I wanted to go away from the title Jamaican making because, because for two reasons. One, it kind of implied that um, art in Jamaica had not existed in some way or another and it kind of, um, it also implied that now suddenly um, there was some kind of artist network or networks where artists had suddenly, suddenly started making artwork and because well, it didn't quite make sense to me but at the same time I, I know Emma very well so I know why she came up with that title um, and Emma um, actually created the show in a very kind of chronological way which was a very kind of art historian way and Emma like myself had also trained to be an academic art historian so I was not surprised about how she approached the show so I wanted to break that circle again a bit like a bit about um, yeah, it's a bit about writing is not always doing something in one way that you know but trying something in a different way. So I wanted to make the exhibition more clearer and take it away from the academic cycle of curatorial practice. So um, I I just felt that the works are really talking to each other. So uh, looking at the works in detail, I could, I could see death. Um, mm -hmm. I could see different forms of spirituality, spirituality and even the form, you know, it was going back to some kind of a paganistic form of spirituality, but also being Jamaica, you could go back to um, to voodoo and other forms of Rastafarian spirituality as well. And then there are other works that clearly touched on the Catholic religion in Jamaica, which I know is really strong. Um, um, my, both my parents come from Jamaica, so we knew and we were brought, we were brought up as Catholics. So I was 
fully connected to that connection to the Catholic references. And so I wanted to really explore the spirituality, but in an open way, because um, there are a couple of artists who are actually challenging the Roman Catholic Church um, about the lack of women becoming priests as well. And I really wanted to push that side out. And that's the kind of feminist aspect to me, is making that visible as well. And at the same time, um, there's a kind of conceptual notion about spirituality because there was a work about um, donations or prayers. You didn't know what, what you were going to pray for or who you were going to pray for, but it was open. So that work was really important to be part of the show because we had a very different notion and open concept about spirituality. It didn't artworks in that exhibition. And I, I wanted to continue the idea about, um, about the body and, um, and death as well. So I didn't want to have the notion of death represented by a human skull because that's just so typical and so symbolic and really obvious so it was it was important to have the dog skull in the exhibition that ended the exhibition because I felt okay I clearly said in the exhibition statement I said the body I didn't say which body I said the body <laughs> yeah. so that was playing around with that kind of concept as well and also people's assumptions thinking okay if you can talk about death and the, and the body people instantly assume it's going to be the human body in some form or another so I wanted to play around with those preconceptions as well from, from the audience and going back to the body when I was looking at the works I could see that we have the real physical body and slowly the physical body was materializing into an abstract body and then um, I want to go deeper into the body so go away from the physical body to the actual body and go inside to the body and that's why we got pieces referring to we got the chair but two chair pieces that were made from blood from the artist and mm. she's also she she's also studied psychology as well so I thought those works were really strong and playing around the idea with um, blood psychology and the human body so that that, that was quite important to the show as well um, and then we had the the, um, the blood cells as well in, in one artist's work by Monique. Um, so you know, going from the color of blood, going deeper into the blood cells, and then we then we have the prayer, what the prayer piece I mentioned, and then we have the dog skull as death. Yeah. And then, but there's also a, an aesthetics going on in the work as well because I was playing around with the colors in some of the works. You know, we had um, the priest, one of the abstract figures um, about prostitution as well. Um, had the blue and black background and Marlo and the, yeah, not, yeah not, not, can't remember, it's not Marlo it might be Marlo's work so I can't and, but the, the, the prayer and donation piece also had the blue and black sorry the pink and black backgrounds but it was it was different tonally but so I was playing around with that language on so that kind of crossover between the space um, but then there was a kind of aesthetic going around the whole space starting with Ethan the form the colours brown being picked up in some of the paintings, the colour red, pink and blue being picked up in some of the paintings. And so narrative went around and it went across. So there were about three, yeah. three layers. And then I wanted to actually think about the title. So the Sweet and Sorrow title comes from the poet um, Andre Bo, who wrote that in 2004. Um, and I thought it was really important to have a Jamaican poet um, somehow involved in this exhibition because I also wanted to think about the importance of literature so it was connected to that and one of the artists Marlando um, there is a Jamaican writer who lives in America and also has connections to London who's an author and writes poetry and isn't an artist so I was playing around with those preconceptions and see who would actually connect that link because the, um, the author in America is very well known so I want to see whether people pick up on the, on the name as yeah. well. And and someone did actually, and actually asked me if it was the same person. I said, no. I said, well done for making the connection. <laughs> but um, but only two people made the connection, so which is fine. But there's been, there was a lot of discussion about the work um, when it was being installed. And even before I finished installing the work, when I just started installing the work, we really had, we had 10 people watching me and the team install the work. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So we, sure. yeah, we had to actually at one point say we really need to ask you to leave so we could continue installing because <laughs> because every time we unwrap a piece of work, we, they get flooded to the work. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, like you know we, we've only got this amount of time to install. We can't yeah. be here for weeks to install. So, but it was nice to know that even before we completely hung the show, that there was an interest in the exhibition. Yeah, and, absolutely. And the exhibition itself was um, extended because people were interested and. At one, well, yeah, when we were actually were doing the exhibition, we had two people come up to see the show. We said, "Well, 
um, we could we're taking it down now. It's been up for quite a while. And it's a, yeah. and it's a, oh, so we didn't know. We've only just found about it. And we, we, we've heard quite a lot about it. And we've only just come to see it. By that time, we had half installed the show. <laughs> so it's not like we could give them time to look at yeah. the whole show. So we said, OK, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you 30 minutes to look at what's there. But we have to continue to deinstall because we got the van arriving, waiting for the work. And we had um, a lot of coverage about the show in different areas, I mean, which is really good for me. And and not in the usual areas. I mean, we had a few coverages in magazines and things, but um, I'm glad it wasn't just in the kind. Of, it wasn't just in the art side of things. It was in different areas, and we had a lot of um, social media coverage about the show as well. And what that's else? great. Yeah. So, I was going to yeah. ask if is it still? Um, so it's obviously not still installed, but is there a way that people can have a look at the work or have you know see a version of the program so that then they could have a look at? Um, the um Teresa's uh, website and see the work that she has and see which works were chosen for the program it's on the Bursley Art Forum website <laughs> and we just now um finished doing putting together the 360 video that's going to be added to the website as well before Christmas oh, brilliant so it's there already so they Excellent. can see they can see the photographs already of the whole show there's, I think there's about 33 images of the show already on the website lovely okay we can get a link to that then for yeah. um, the podcast yeah. um so I've I did a uh, I looked at some of your writing I was uh, I read the essay construction and destruction mm. of artist and art object from 2019 um just to kind of get a feel for the kind of things that you look at and talk about um, what interested me actually was your the choice of artists, um, the three female artists, Phoebe Boswell, Incy Evener, I might have said that wrong, and uh, Chenny Chung. Mm -hmm. And it made me ask, because obviously you're a curator, but you're also a teacher and a writer. So in all of those roles, you have the, for want of a better word, the power, the responsibility of um, selecting artists and then sharing them. Um, with wider audiences, with students, everything. So what um, process do you go through to choose or select artists um, for any of those? Is it is it the same process for those things when you're teaching, when you're writing or when you're curating or do you have different processes? I have different processes, <laughs> completely different processes. Um, Oh, I just I think I'm going to answer that because <laughs> that's that's a really interesting question for me no one's actually asked me that before um mm. so maybe I should answer that by starting with that particular essay that you refer to and then take it from there so that essay came about because I was I was at an art fair I, it was a London art fair and it was the um, a Thai a Chinese gallery at the London Art Fair who was actually representing her and had shown was showing her work, and that work instantly attracted my attention because of the process that she was using to make the work. And at the time, um, I didn't know the full story behind the work, but it was the technology aspect of the work that drew me in. Because I, it made me curious. I mentioned earlier that I'm naturally curious. So it made me curious about the work. So I did actually talk to the, it turned out to be the gallery owner at the time about the work. Obviously, she was more interested in trying to sell me the work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but and I was I was with my friend and we were actually thinking about maybe coming together to buy, buy the work, but we didn't do that in the end um, for various reasons. Um, but I was more interested in actually knowing more about the work and, and what was behind the work. So when I had a chance to look at that and talk to the artist directly and to, to the gallery who actually enabled me to have that communication with the artist, my interest in her work became more, in, I would say intense, but um, more circumstantial, but more, more the curiosity got deeper as well. Yeah. And... I was also conscious about Phoebe Boswell's work. I met Phoebe very, very briefly at some art event, I only said hello and goodbye. I had a few chats about some of the work that she was working on, but she was really talking to other people. So I, I was glad not to have that involvement with her, but I was, I was conscious about her work and I liked the way she was actually using her drawing and incorporating technology into her drawing. 
And I encountered an INSEE because I knew that she was working with Roger Malbert, who at that time was my partner, but he's now my husband. So he introduced me to her work because he was writing about her work for um, one of the things that he was working on at that time. And so when he showed me her work, I instantly got curious about her work as well because I was looking at how she's using technology and how she was using drawing as well. And I wanted to actually write about those three artists because I realized that they were doing something that was really interesting in relation to process. But as I dealt deeper into the content of the work, I realized there were so many connections going on in the work. And I wanted to really think about this idea about drawing the object. And we spent we spent so much time with the object in in our discussions about art, especially about contemporary art at, at many different levels. And I just wanted to really take apart the idea about the object. And I felt that these three artists were doing that. And it was nice not to, it was nice not to actually be given an artist who is well established who is well known to, to find something else to say about them that would maybe end up promoting them in some way or another. I'm, I'm really interested in artists I don't know about. Mm -hmm. That gives me the space to learn more and to communicate with them when and if possible. But to communicate with the work is crucial for me as well. And the same thing happens when, when I'm teaching Right, I'm here, I'm at the University of London now. It's one of the days I'm here on, on my um, part-time contract. Um, it's a very diverse university. At the same time, um, I'm very conscious how diverse it is in some areas, but not diverse in others. So when I'm engaging with the students here, it's always important for me to kind of get to know where they're coming from. So I don't necessarily assume by skin color, I assume um, I find out by communication. And the students themselves become part of my network because I'm listening to them as they're talking to me and they're listening to me as I'm talking to them. And I travel quite a lot or have, well, obviously like COVID might be, that's been reduced, but I'm, I'm going back into traveling again. And I spent quite a lot of time traveling around the world. So when I'm meeting um, students who have come from Romania or I'm meeting students who have come from um, Hungary, et cetera, they're quite surprised that they've actually got someone who actually knows their language or actually yeah. knows their culture. Um, and that's important to them as well. So, um, so when I'm talking to them and engaging with them, I'm not just talking about, you know, the idea about, colonialism, post-colonialism or de decolonizing the curriculum because you have people from Romania who are hungry who have not had that kind of experience or Western colonialism. They've had a different kind of colonialism under, under Russia, under USSR. So their experiences are completely different. So when I'm working with them, what I do and how I do it is also taking them into account as well. So who and what we look at is also being fed into what they know and what they share and what I know and what I can share as well. And I think that's really important for me as a teacher you know, um, is to have that mutual engagement and to break down that kind of hierarchical notion of having power and knowing that you know best. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mutual relationship. And the students don't actually encounter me until they get to um, the third year, the, the, what we call level six, when the, the year when they start getting ready to leave university. And I, I'm very conscious that the time they get to me, they've gone through one kind of process, um, maybe from foundation up to when they become second years. So they kind of make assumptions about what I'm going to do. So when they start realizing that I'm doing things completely differently, they open up more, mm -hmm. and which is good. And that's what I that's that's what I prefer. That that's how I like to teach, and that's how I engage as well. If I'm doing things like the open call, for instance, which I'm doing with Procreate, we've got the um, shortlist to. Do, on Friday to go through the, everything. Um, that's different because I know nothing about the artist. It's all anonymous. So I, I, what I'm looking at is the work. What I'm trying to understand is what is the work saying to me? Um, obviously, you have to read the artist statements as, as well. I take into account that people have English as their second language. So maybe the language isn't clear. So it's important for me to understand what the work is saying. Uh, but equally, the work has to be 
of a good quality. I, I won't. I, I, I won't do tokenistic um, procedures. The work has to be worthwhile and needs to be and has to be deserved to be part of an exhibition for an open call. Because I am looking at the work first. I'm looking at the statement second. Then I'm going back to the work and I'm spending time looking at the work before I make my judgment about the work. Sometimes I'm wrong and people disagree with me about what I select, which is fine, you know, <laughs> which is fine, but that's a, that's a completely different process. And then um, spending time with loads of creators and looking at what they're doing with their shows and who they pick, it's sometimes nice having conversations with them, saying, well, why did you do that? That doesn't make sense. Or why did you do that? Doesn't make sense. But they have to be open to have those conversations as well. So, um, and they have to be open about curatorial practice and what that might mean to them, how they might challenge themselves. Um, not many curators reflect on their practice, curatorial practice. They just go on to, they go on to the next thing, <laughs> which I find quite frustrating. And I remember um, talking to Roger um, about curatorial practice and I just said, why don't creators spend more time researching? I said, and he said, they do research. I said, yes, but not enough. <laughs> so I, I'm very conscious now that um, curatorial practice has actually allowed artists to do to do more research. And being involved with the Emerging Creators Group with um, Tate Ban, I have the important importance of creating. But and we talked about um, creating and research, and we talked about different types of research as well. Um, research is reading, but research is also visual language as well. Research is also visual language for different kind of contexts and different kind of countries, and understanding that, and not assuming that you can just put something into a box because that's what that's what your exhibition is about. It's been yeah. it's really pushing the boundaries. So I'm glad that with the Emerging Creators Group, that is now coming through. And we're going to see a new exciting generation of creators in the years ahead. Amazing. Well, that leads me on very nicely, actually, to my last question for you, Pauline. Um, so as someone who's been involved in pushing for diversity um, since the 90s, what changes have you seen and what is worrying or exciting about the future? Well, I just mentioned the creators group, which I'm, yeah. and yeah, which is going to be exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing how creating is going to be developed. And one of the things from that, we've been talking about Britishness, and I've been pushing the idea about global Britishness and talking about um, how people in different locations and also under the old colonial and post colonial aspect deal with creating. So um, allowing more voices to come through and. I mentioned the idea I mentioned earlier about um, people coming from Hungary, Romania. Um, I think um, decolonization of the curriculum, et cetera, is good. But on my concern, it can be too narrow because, again, it doesn't think about these other voices and another experience of colonialism. So if we're going to decolonize anything, then that terminology and that methodology needs to be more open and it needs to engage with more voices. And that also ties into what we um, describe as diversity in relation to funding, um, funding in relation to university funding, funding in relation to arts council funding, funding in relation to um, private funding. That's why I'm involved in the Beacon Collective. It's a group of philanthropists coming from different areas who have an interest in different kind of forms of philanthropy. So at the moment, I'm um, chair of the working group um, looking at diversity in relation to private philanthropy and we that well we're going to be writing a report and that's going to be available sometime next year and right. we got a we got um clear view who were on the marketing team who which is also um a group of diverse people from different kind of cultural backgrounds jewish black etc indian um involved in that research and looking at private philanthropy because just again to get at understanding what it means to be involved as a franchise of private organisations or um, who have interest in those, but also put that towards visual culture in the UK as well. So I know that there are developments there, so I'm looking forward to that. And I've pushed that to actually open up to talk about the, um, the another form of colonialism from the from the old Central Europe and Eastern Europe. So we're, we're also incorporating that into our approach as well. So that would be interesting to see how that develops beyond 2023. Um, where are we? Okay, um, EDI, oh yeah. 
um, equity, diversity and inclusion is great. My problem is that it's too, um, it's too institutional in relation to its language, its university language. Um, it's not tick box, it depends who uses it for the university. Um, I'm very much involved on that side of things at University of London, so I'm very much involved in not making it tick box and pushing that further. And we have something called the Council of Art and Education called SHEED. So I'm involved in that and getting universities in the UK to push their ideas about EDI. So that's something I will be starting in 2023. So I'm hoping that will develop into something new as well. Um, okay, um, I, my concern is about backlash as well. Um, we've had the Venice Benali where we've had women and we've had a large diversity of artists being engaged. Um, I think it's taken the Venice Benali committee 10 years to finally get, get it, but um, I'm not sure whether it's going to be um, part, and part of the existing approach to curatorial practice and engagement with Venice Benali or whether it's like, okay, now it's a tick box, we can go back and still do the same thing. So yeah. I, I would, would actually like new models to be part of the Venice Benali and also Documenta. Um, I don't know what's happened to Manifesto. Manifesto has gone completely quiet. Um, I used to really enjoy engaging with Manifesto. Um, I would like Manifesto to raise its voice. Um, and tell us what they're doing and how they can actually maybe get involved with the Venice Finale documentary to talk about new models of presenting global art. So that, that's that's what I think should happen. And those are my concerns. Amazing. Thank you, Pauline. Um, I think that's a great place to finish. Um, lots to think about for listeners and for myself. I've made tons of notes. Um, really exciting. Thank you ever so much um, for talking to us, Pauline. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciated it. And thank you for letting me share my thoughts. I hope people don't completely disagree with me and might engage with something. But thank you very much, Susan. No problem. You've been listening to the Woman Up podcast. This podcast is produced by artists Amy Dignam and Susan Merrick in association with the Women's Art Library. You can find many more episodes by subscribing to us on all of your usual podcasting platforms or by following us on Instagram at woman.up.podcast.